This is the feast of Jesus Christ the King. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1. Brethren, we give thanks to God the Father who has made us worthy to share the lot of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, the remission of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For in him were created all things in the heavens and on the earth, things visible and things invisible, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers. All things have been created through and unto him. And he is before all creatures, and in him all things consist. Again, he is the head of the body, the church. He who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the first place. For it has pleased God the Father that in him all his fullness should dwell, and that through him he should reconcile to himself all things, whether on the earth or in the heavens, making peace through the blood of his cross in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. From St. John, chapter 18. At that time Pilate said to Jesus, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Dost thou say this of thyself, or have others told thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own people and the chief priests have delivered thee to me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would certainly have fought that I might not be delivered to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Thou art then a king? Jesus answered, Thou sayest it, I am a king. This is why I was born, and why I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. This is the great feast of our Lord Jesus Christ as King. Our Lord Jesus Christ is King for three reasons, says Pope Pius XI, based on, of course, the sacred scriptures and the reality of the nature of who our Lord Jesus Christ really is. Our Lord Jesus Christ is one with the Father and the Holy Ghost. He is God, the second person of the Trinity from all eternity. In his divinity, he never had a beginning. In his humanity, he had a beginning. On Christmas Day, when he was born in the flesh, and on March 25th, nine months, nine months before, by the power of the Holy Ghost, conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God. He is King. He is the eternal High Priest. And this feast, is a, is a great joy for us Catholics when we see our Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ in every way mocked, in every way spit on by the vile media, by the governments of the Western world, and by all the modern governments who regulate our Lord Jesus Christ to some box in a desk. And our Lord Jesus Christ scorned in every way, ignored, this is the greatest crime of the modern nations, to, is to ignore Jesus Christ as God as King and put him on an equal foot with all the other false religions. This is one of the greatest insults to the true God. And Pope Pius XI says that our Lord will hold the greatest torments in hell for those who have ripped him out of the public life. Because if you rip out Jesus Christ from the public domain, from the political domain, 
the social domain, the economic domain. That means the loss of tens and tens and millions of souls. Because souls need other souls, family need families, we belong to a society. And it is the duty of the state, the men who govern, to recognize and uphold the true religion. And that is why in our age, we're at the bottom of the barrel. When our Lord Jesus Christ has been rooted out, and so for us Catholics, who want to be faithful to Jesus Christ the King, who want to keep the true faith and not modernize it and not compromise it with the modern world and its, and its false ideas, we want to stand on the shoulders of all the great popes who proclaim Jesus Christ as God and King. And for us this is a joyful feast because in, this, in spite of all this modern apostasy and compromise and and the rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ at every level. It's a joy for us to proclaim Him King. It's a joy for us because <clears throat> we know our Lord, he may, his, his church may be, be reduced to a handful, but the gates of hell will not prevail. And we know we are few in this fight for the faith, and, but we know we're going to win. We're going to win, even if there's just one Catholic left on earth to hold the true faith. Christ is not going to be crushed. And as he told St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, when he ordered that the king of France put his sacred heart on the flag, and of course the king had better ideas, and he didn't do it. And France was punished a hundred years with the terrible French Revolution, which was the overthrow of the whole Catholic social order, the overthrow of Christendom. But our Lord told St. Margaret Mary, I will reign in spite of my enemies. I will reign, my heart will reign, he said, in spite of all that Satan rises up to oppose me, and all the men that he raises up to oppose me. And we are seeing now not only the men given to the, the political realm, but the very men of the church, the very Pope himself, the last Vatican II Popes, uncrowning Jesus Christ, mocking Jesus Christ, the King. <coughs> and now these bishops and the, the clergy, uh, the wholesale <coughs> apostasy, as Our Lady of Fatima foretold what happened, and we're living through it now. And Our Lady did speak of the diabolical disorientation that would affect the churchmen. And now this di diabolical disorientation is affecting the, the leaders of the Society of St. Pius X. And for two years this, this revolution and these modern ideas and this compromised spirit has infected like a, a disease the whole family of tradition so that we have good brothers, good priests, good faithful, saying, well, we should get in with Rome. Vatican II is interpretable in the light of tradition. We have to make peace. We can't be warring all the time. But our Lord didn't say, lay down your weapons. Our Lord didn't say, make peace with the enemy. Our Lord told us, you'd be ready. I died for you. They're not going to treat the servant worse than the master. The servants are going to get the same treatment. You will be put out of the synagogues. You will be put to death. You will be persecuted in my name. And that's what we must expect. And now this, this terrible compromise in the Society of St. Pius X. It's a, ter it's a terrible thing to happen. And the leaders will, will answer to Christ the King. And it's very sad. I remind you of the beasts of the apocalypse. One of the beasts is the locusts. The locusts who have teeth of lions, claws of bears, but they've got, they've got beautiful long hair of women. What does this mean, this beast? Hair of women, eyeshadow, but teeth of a tiger, and the claws of a bear. What is this beast? 
And uh, I can recall Bishop Williamson giving us in scripture class, the fathers of the church, what they said about this beast. And they said this, this beast with the f long, flowing, girly hair is those leaders who will have effeminate ideas. And the effeminate ideas are modern compromise, ecumenism, religious liberty, collegiality, which is democracy in the church, freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, freedom of to teach whatever you want in any university, <clears throat> Freedom of the press, which poisons the mind. We are more brainwashed, our age, than anybody sitting in the concentration camps of Stalin. We are brainwashed, and we want it. And this beast of the apocalypse, the long hair is the effeminate ideas, but the teeth of the tiger and the claws of the bear because these ideas are vicious. They root out the faith from the hearts. They tear out the state of grace from souls. And is not this our modern men? Is this not our modern men since Pope Paul VI and our political leaders? All smiles, suit and tie. They're not running around with the ripped up blue jeans and colored t-shirts that are torn. They're all conservative looking, clean haircuts. And the clergy are all smiles. Pope John Paul II was all smiles. Pope Francis is definitely all smiles. Bishop Fillet is all smiles. But the effeminate ideas are taking souls to hell. The effeminate ideas are ripping the faith out of the minds and the hearts. And when the leaders cave in, especially in the family of tradition, especially the sons of Archbishop Lefebvre, we have been trained, like the Marine Corps, like the uh, Navy SEALs, we have been trained to fight specifically this enemy of modernism. And what happens when they start talking like modernists and using double phrases like modernists and punishing those who want to be loyal sons of the popes of tradition and of Archbishop Lefebvre, expelling them, silencing them, transferring them, like Father Beauvais in France. He was a leader. He was a great son of Archbishop Lefebvre. And, well, he kind of caved in, and now he's sent to preach to the crickets in Madrid. And Father Peter Scott to, to, to preach to the baboons out in South Africa. And these priests should be wiser than this. They should imitate the founder and not hide the light under the bushel. So pray for these priests. But don't be deceived by the smiles and the gentleness and the sweetness, because it's not the sweetness of the Sacred Heart. Our Lord Jesus Christ, His sweetness is, is loyal to the truth. His sweetness draws souls, and he, he warns us. The sweetness of my heart, He says, pick up your cross and follow me. And by through the cross, you will taste the sweetness. Through following our Lord in self-denial, you will discover the sweetness of God, of the true heart of Jesus, that is not of this world. It's not empty, but you will suffer. You will suffer persecution. And that's how our Lord is. He's very, he's very honest. If you follow me, it's going to be tough. It's going to be rough. You're going to be thirsty. You're going to be getting blisters. You're following a path that's full of thorns. But you'll have happiness of your soul. You'll have the true peace of your soul. And you will obtain heaven. And the devil, as you know, is, another, is a liar. He, he, he promises sweetness in this world. Sweetness, sweetness, sweetness. But it leaves the soul bitter. And it robs the souls of the faith. And if you lose the faith, if any of us lose the faith, We cannot save our soul. We will burn in hell forever. So, on this great feast of Christ the King, realize this beast of the apocalypse and don't fall for it. The sweetness and the smiles and the gentleness is one of the deceptions of the devil. And 
in the Society of St. Pius X, that document of uh, the doctrinal declaration. It is so serious a compromise of the faith. And everybody wants to say, well, it's a dead document. It's not, it's not what it meant to say, but it's not what it says. And if you or I signed that document, I know if I signed it, I would go straight to hell. Because it compromises with Vatican II, accepts it in the light of tradition, which is called the hermeneutics of Benedict XVI, Pope Benedict XVI. It accepts the new code of canon law, which is loaded with heresies, allows communion to the non-Catholics, twists the ends of marriage, exalts the democracy within the church by basically erasing the cler clerical state, and uh, it's Vatican II on wheels. It's Vatican II in real life, as Pope John Paul II himself said when he signed the new code of canon law. How can Bishop Fillet accept this totally? And the new oath of fidelity, condemned by Archbishop Lefebvre, now he, he signs on to it. And the new mass is legitimate. Huh? This, if you look at the agreements done by Campos, they don't even say all that. If you look at the agreements done by La Barou, or any of the groups of tradition that compromise with modernist Rome, none of them signed on to all that Bishop Foulet has signed on to. And then yet still people are deceived. They're still, well, he's nice, he smiles, he's sweet. But remember the beasts with the long feminine hair and the teeth of tigers. That's what we're dealing with. Archbishop Lefebvre was a true bishop of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. He loved souls and he warned us the greatest danger threatening our faithful is to put ourselves under modernist Rome and conciliar bishops. And now in this recent interview with Monsignor Pozzo, he's the head of the Ecclesia Dei Commission, he basically spills, spills the beans and says, the agreement's coming soon. It's, it's imminent. And basically, it's already done with Bishop Fillet signing the doctrinal declaration. All that's missing now is the public declaration of the agreement being public. <clears throat> the 30 pieces of silver has been paid. The 30 pieces of silver was paid two years ago, 2012. And that's why we, we as Catholics, we don't want to water down our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to follow our Lord Jesus Christ, not the Vatican II version, not the Protestant version, not the infidelity, of course, of the Muslim, but we've, we want to fight and stay faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ, the King, the eternal High Priest, the one who founded his Catholic Church and against whom the gates of hell, hell will not prevail. And so we battle on. As St. John Chrysostom said in the early days of the monks, Many of these monks were arrested and taken and uh, slaughtered with the sword by Muslims, by later by Muslims, and by uh, heretics, and by the pagans. And St. John Chrysostom says about the monks of the early days, they fight the devil as if dancing. They're joyful in their fight. And that's what we must be also. We are in this war, we all feel the pressure, we all feel the, 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 the persecution of this modern world at every level. But we must be joyful in the, the reign of Christ the King. Because I will reign, he says, I will reign in spite of my enemies. And that reign will come when a Pope, whoever Pope it will be, will consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Listen to the voice of uh, the great Cardinal P. of Poitiers. St. Pius X called him my master, and he took his pontifical name from him, Pius. Pius X took his name from Pius uh, of, of Poitiers, Cardinal Pius. In French, it's Cardinal P. And this is what he says, Christ must reign here below by inspiring the laws by sanctifying the morals 
by enlightening the instruction, that's education, by guiding the councils at the political level and in the church, by regulating the actions of the governments as well as of the people governed. Wherever Jesus Christ does not reign, there is disorder and decadence. That's the modern world, disorder and decadence. He also says, if our Lord Jesus Christ does not reign by his presence, bringing many blessings over the whole countries, he will reign by his absence. And when he's absent from the constitutions, when he's absent from our flags, when he's absent from our laws, and from our schools and universities, when Christ is so absent you can't find him anymore, and the modern schools are telling all these kids about Judaism, and all these kids about the Muslim religion, which will take them straight to hell, and they, that Jesus Christ is outlawed in the Western world. And when Jesus Christ is outlawed and ignored, these countries will undergo decadence, decomposition, confusion, and eventually total destruction, as Our Lady of Fatima forewarned us. Whole nations will be totally blown off the face of the earth. And when William Thomas Walsh, <clears throat> who wrote on Fatima, wrote also about the glories of Spain and the glorious Inquisition and the glorious uh, kingship of Jesus Christ in the Spanish countries especially, when he approached and met with the real Sister Lucia, Sister Lucia, he asked her, is America, the glorious America, the great republic of America, is this included in the prophecies of Our Lady to be steamrolled and infiltrated and crushed by communism and the errors of communism, which is basically glorified materialism and godlessness? She said, yes, America's included. And when America and Canada are now passing laws glorifying the Sodomites, and now we have a pope permitting his modernist bishops to even question, even raise the question about this. We have fire and brimstone, folks. We have fire and brimstone coming. It's coming. So we must brace ourselves. Many will be spared who are faithful to the Virgin Mary, who wear her scapular and pray the rosary. Our Lord will spare a, a, a large number of, of his flock so that on the other side of the chastisement to come, they will rebuild along the, the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Virgin Mary promised a victory, something greater than Guadalupe, something greater than the Middle Ages. But when these laws are passed, and when this sodom sodomitism infects the heads of the clergy, what's going to stop the wrath of God? when the leaders of the church crucify our Lord again <clears throat> and uh, lead so many souls to hell. This is our time. This is our age of apostasy. But we must fight. Let me just remind you of an era when Catholics always had to fight. And they fought on the same principles and they're fighting the same for the same reign of Christ the King as we are now. And this is a, a piece of history that many of us are not aware of. Father Jacquemin, who just joined with the resistance, he's from Flanders, which is now uh, mostly Belgium. The Belgians are fighters, and they were a great Catholic country. It was the Netherlands and the Flanders. And Archbishop Lefebvre was from that area, on the, uh, touching the French border. So his stock was uh, very close to the Flemish fighters. And the famous war of the War of 1798, the War of the <coughs> Farmers. We've all heard of the glorious Catholic fighters in the Vendée in France. But not all of us have heard of the glorious, equally glorious fighters in the Flanders in now modern-day Belgium. It was called the War of the Farmers. And when the, in, the, in the French Revolution, when the 
armies of the masonry of the Republic came to overthrow the Catholic altars, to burn down the churches, to smash the statues, to arrest the priests and force them to make the oath of allegiance to the Masonic Republic, which in Flanders, out of 9,000 priests, less than 1,000 did sign the oath. In France, many more signed the oath. They went with it. And this oath is equivalent in, in gravity to the, the, to the declaration, the doctrinal declaration signed by Bishop Follet. That is how serious this doctrinal declaration is. That for the sake of keeping faithful to Christ the King, over 9,000 in an all of that area in France, easily over 10,000 priests refused to sign this compromise against the faith. And they went to death. They were starved to death. They were sent to prison. They were drowned. They were decapitated by the guillotine. Thousands and thousands of priests and faithful. So what happened? The armies marched in and uh, the Flemish soldiers, they didn't have much. They had a few guns. They had a, few, they had a lot of hoes because they were farmers. A lot of rakes, a lot of rocks. And they went to war. And they fought. And they fought bravely. And there's one account in Westerlo. Westerlo, which is now a, a town in Belgium. In 1797, there was a priest hiding in, the, in a farm. Because the priest had to go in disguise and say mass and barns, basements, and mountains, and, and all different places. They were dressed up like Father Pro during the persecution in Mexico. Dressed up like milkmen, like mechanics, like blacksmiths, like married men. And uh, in, in this town, <coughs> the Masonic soldiers came in, surrounded the church, barricaded the church, and they took all the vessels, and they smashed the tabernacle. They took all the, the golden monstrance, the chalices, the candlesticks. And they, they, what they usually do is send this to the place where they melt it all down to make bullets and French money with the, the seal of the, of the goddess of liberty. So what happened? The, these, these Catholics in Westerlo led by a, a great man whose, whose name was Mr. Van Gansen. He gathered all the farmers together, and on their horses they chased down the Masonic armies. And by the time they got there, it was a full day's racing on the horses and running. The, by that time, the Masonic soldiers were partying up in an inn, celebrating their victory over taking and looting a Catholic church. So they were drinking in this bar, a tavern. <coughs> and these, these Belgians, these Flemish, surrounded this bar. And they uh, silently broke in and killed them all. Dragged their bodies out, heaped them all in a pile. And then they went in to find where's the monstrance, where's the sacred vessels. And one of the men found it under a bench, took out the bag, and uh, Mr. Van Gansen, since he was the leader, he took, took the bag and he took out the golden monstrance, the big one, set it on the table. And just to show the depth of the faith in these people, they, the, our Lord wasn't even in that monstrance. It didn't contain the Blessed Sacrament. It was just the vessel. All these men, all these tough soldiers, all these tough farmers, all of them knelt down and closed their eyes to thank Christ for, for having, been, having given them this chance to rescue these vessels. And they adored what, where Christ is exposed in the Blessed Sacrament. He wasn't even there, and they had such a respect for the things of the sacred. And that's just one small example. And uh, all over in the, the Flanders, they fought. Their fight was <coughs> pro aris et focis, which means for the altar and for the hearth. 
In other words, for the faith and for the home, for our families. And these for families were rooted in medieval Europe. They were deeply Catholic people. And they fought nobly in uh, 1798. They fought with all they had. But most of them were finally captured and bulldozed and slaughtered. And in God's eyes, is that a loss? Same with the Vendée. They didn't win the war, but they resisted till death. And in God's eyes, was that resistance useless? In God's eyes, it was a victory beyond belief. Why? Because all those martyrs who shed their blood for the true faith now went straight to heaven. They all fought for the right cause. Even though on earth they lost, they won in heaven. And that's, that's how it's been for the last 400 years. All the martyrs in Protestant England and Scotland, all the martyrs in Ukraine, betrayed by Pope Paul VI, like uh, Cardinal Joseph <coughs> Slepe in Ukraine. He said Paul VI abandoned all these people. He betrayed them all because he wanted to befriend the modern world and the communists. And same with Cardinal Mazzenti. He exposed publicly the betrayal of Pope Paul VI, who wanted his Vatican II brought in. And, uh, and then all, all the Cristeros in Mexico and in France during the French Revolution and, and uh, during the communist persecutions all over the, the globe, especially in the East, all, they were all fighting the same principles we are fighting now as traditional Catholics. Separation of church and state is a liberal principle which uncrowns Jesus Christ the King, mocks Jesus Christ the King, and puts all the religions on an equal foot, and it leads logically to no religion. It leads logically to atheism, <coughs> as the popes of the last 200 years have been warning. <clears throat> Our fight is the same, and Archbishop Lefebvre wanted you to understand this. We are not fighting for our own little chapel and our own little incense and our own little idea. We're fighting for the Roman Catholic Church of Tradition. We're fighting for our Lord Jesus Christ, King, Eternal High Priest, and God. That's our fight, and separation of church and state dissolves Jesus Christ. Vatican II dissolves Jesus Christ. Religious liberty makes a mockery of Jesus Christ. Ecumenism crucifies Jesus Christ the King. And that's why there can be no compromise with these, these Masonic ideas that triumphed at Vatican II. And this is why what, what is happening in the Society of Presidents is so serious. It's the, it's the triumph of Freemasonry within the family of tradition. And for us, we will not tolerate it. We will not compromise. And if that means our death and persecution and starvation and whatever, blessed be God and may he give us the strength to endure for him. But we're not at that point now. We still have it easy. We have it easy compared to our ancestors. And still people are afraid. Still people are scared to death. But you, dear faithful, don't ever forget the words of Archbishop Lefebvre. As he said himself, our fight is the same as the Catholics during the French Revolution. It's the same as the Catholics who uh, went and defended the syllabus of errors against the liberals of Pope, uh, uh, during the time of Pope Pius IX. Our fight is the same of Pius X condemning modernism. Our fight is the same as all those great well, very few bishops and priests who stood up against Vatican II. It's the same fight, same masonry, same beast with the long, flowing, girly hair, but the teeth of lions and the claws of the bear. That's the beast of our days. All nice and sweet, but poisonous. So, dear faithful, Look at these great martyrs of Flanders and the Vendée. Look at the martyrs of Mexico and England and Scotland. And uh, the priests, all they had to do was sign an oath. Same with the 
people. All they had to do was accept the new mainstream ideas and they wouldn't be bothered. Life would go easy. And for them, life did go easy. But where's their souls now? They had their reward on earth. And many of them are now under our feet burning forever in hell. It's not worth it. So let's pray to the Mother of God. Through her, the, Christ, the reign of Christ the King is going to come back. He wants it through her. That's why he wants the Pope to consecrate Russia specifically with all the bishops to his mother's immaculate heart. He doesn't want it any other way because he wants his mother, her heart, honored with his heart. Because her heart stood right under his heart and when his heart was punctured on the cross and opened by the lance, who felt that wound? Whose heart bled with her divine son? Christ was already dead. He didn't feel it. But the living martyr at the foot of the cross, she felt it. And that wound would have killed her. But God miraculously sustained her life. She suffered beyond what any of us can comprehend. And the Immaculate Heart, our Lord, wants her heart honored with His so how are we going to keep the faith today? How are we going to be strong in, the, in these times? How are we going to be faithful in these days? It's going to be by being very united and close and consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. God wants it. He wills it. That's His crusade. And that's His, that's his banner. The heart of His mother. So we, ride, we gather under her heart. And in this time of uh, warfare, we have to fight. And you, uh, good men, read They Have Uncrowned Him by Archbishop Lefebvre. Read that book. Read it every year. Read it uh, often. Look back at it often. It's so powerful. It's the engine of the problem. And he puts it right on the liberalism and modernism, and Sionism and democracy. And then it's, it's all about the social kingship of Christ. Read that book and spread it. It is heavy. It's heavy meat and potatoes. We all know that. <coughs> but read it. A lot will sink through. They have been crowned by Archbishop Lefebvre. And, <coughs> and you men, what can you do? What can you do? Lead the family rosary. Gather together with uh, people of like mind of the, of the Catholic faith of traditions, of the resistance. Study together these questions. Study the encyclicals together. <coughs> and uh, the men, you, you're bound to some Catholic action. You are bound to do some Catholic action. Whether it's uh, having what's called the Black Rosary, which the missionaries did in many of the third world countries in Africa. The Black Rosary is <coughs> you invite neighbors to the house, you pray the rosary, you have a little little banquet or something, and uh, you do this frequently. And through this you, you might convert some souls. And then eventually in some of these towns they actually have a procession of the rosary around their block, in their streets, carrying the statue of Our Lady. And people see this, they're curious, and they come to know the faith. That is a possibility. In the workplace, be fearless. Make the sign of the cross at grace. Don't join in the dirty talk and immoral jokes. Be men of virtue, and, and that speaks for itself. Be honest in business. And spread the faith by example for sure, by words when you, when it's time, when you see it's necessary. You're the salt of the earth. If the salt's not sprinkled and spread out, what good is it? It's got to be sprinkled out everywhere. <coughs> Firstly, by example. And you wives, you good ladies, how do you spread the kingship of Christ? Well, you do it very physically. <laughs> by taking the children God sends you. Take the children God sends you. Our Lord wants children. And if you're married, take the children God wants. Look at all the saints, how many of them came at the at tail end of a large family, like Mother Mary Elias of the Blessed Sacrament. 
She was the 18th child out of 20 in, Mexi in Mexico. So be generous. And you older ladies, don't think you're retired. You've got to give the faith to your grandchildren and godchildren and their friends and their families. And you pray. And your loneliness and your arthritis and your suffering goes to help many souls. It's to snatch them from hell. Nothing is wasted in God's plan. And you youth, you youngsters, and you seminarians, what a glorious thing to consecrate your life to God, to Christ the King and Our Lady, in an age where there's no glory in it, when, in an age when there's no pension to make, in an age when all you are is scorned and ridiculed by most of the modern world. But the, the people of goodwill, they know. They know a good priest. And, they, and when they understand that you oppose this modernism, those of goodwill know. They know it's the right thing. And uh, pray to be good priests, you, you seminarians. You're in training now. And uh, we have the whole Our Lady Mount Carmel Seminary here with us today. It's not that big. But here it is. It's the little army uh, ready to fight. And you will be priests of Archbishop Lefebvre and of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will sacrifice for souls. You will travel to bring the Mass, to absolve sins. And you will not be one of those priests who say, I just want my own parish and my own little flock, and that's it. You will be priests of our Lord Jesus Christ to conquer this world to Jesus Christ the King. And not a selfish priest, but a priest of the Sacred Heart. That's what Archbishop Lefebvre wanted. That's why at 80 something years old he was traveling the whole world. And we hear priests, even of the resistance, say, I don't want to travel. Granted, some of them are old, granted, some can't travel, and they'll do their best, and God knows. And they don't sin in any way, obviously. But when they have good health and can travel, that is, that is one of the crosses we must carry. And even yesteryear, the Ukrainian priests, where my ancestors came from in uh, northern Alberta, in Mondaire, in Begraville area, those priests were on horse on Sunday traveling to all the different villages to bring Mass, the Ukrainian Catholic Mass. So it's nothing really new. But you will be priests of the Sacred Heart and priests as Archbishop Lefebvre wanted them to be. And then uh, you youngsters who are still young, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your whole life ahead of you? And you have the great examples of so many youngsters who, who were ready to die martyrs. So many. And so be generous with God. Pray to know God's will, you youngsters. And think, does our Lord want me to give my life as a nun, as a priest? as a monk, as a brother, to fight in this, these last battles left for the reign of Christ the King and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We're on the winning side. I will reign in spite of my enemies, the voice of Jesus Christ the King. So let's go now to the great heart of Jesus, the true King. He is such a king, such a king is he, that he comes down from heaven on the altar now in this Mass. This king comes to visit us. Try getting the president on the phone. Good luck. <laughs> Trying to get him to visit your house. Good luck. Well, who would want him anyway? This one. <laughs> but the king of heaven and earth in the Mass, he comes down like fire from heaven on this altar. He knows you're tired. He knows you're weary. He knows we're a little confused in all this confusion. But he still, the king comes down. And what does he feed you? A few crackers? What does he give you? A few autographs? He gives you everything he possibly can give. His body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. His great <coughs> sacrifice of the altar, of the mass, of himself on the cross. His mother, he gives you his grace. He gives you guardian angels to help you fight. He gives you all this doctrine. What more can we want? So serve God joyfully 
and serve joyfully this king who, having joy set before him, endured the passion of the cross to save souls and your souls. And let's drink this wine that he gives us of his own precious blood, asking him, strengthen me, Lord, in this fight. Strengthen me in this battle that I might march and fight under your banner and up to the Immaculate Heart of your mother. O Mary, conceived without sin, Pray for us every course to O Mary, conceived without sin, Pray for us every course to O Mary, conceived without sin, Pray for us every course to thee. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.